Welcome in to the New Orleans Pelicans podcast, the official podcast of your New Orleans Pelicans, a podcast dedicated to everything you need to know about the squad. Hear from players, coaches, broadcasters, and those who cover the NBA on a daily basis. It's time to flock up. The New Orleans Pelicans podcast starts right now. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the New Orleans Pelicans podcast, the official podcast of your New Orleans Pelicans. I'm Gus Kattengel, Jim Eichenhofer, and John DeShazer is going to be joining us here next segment to break down last night's game, game one of two straight against the Golden State Warriors. New Orleans going down 124 to 106, some very interesting numbers, some very interesting things to take away through four games already. Pels 2-2 two and two on this season as the Warriors improved to 3-1. and one. Overall thoughts, head coach Willie Green, as to what happened last night? Well, it, it was fueled by our turnovers. Um, we just shot ourselves in the foot over and over again. They're, look, they're an, an aggressive defensive team, and if you don't take care of the ball against them, it fuels their transition opportunities. They're getting threes. They're getting to the basket. They're getting to the free throw line, and you got you're in for a long night. And, and that's what it comes down to is being aggressive defensively, uh, but really offensively, we just shot ourselves and we gave them too many opportunities. You'll hear from Brandon Ingram and Zion Williamson their thoughts as to where the team is and also what took place on that court in San Francisco. But want to get to a player that is going to be very interesting. And look, you saw. Last night, the importance on how Golden State defended Jordan Hawkins and what he can maybe bring to this team as the season goes on. Andrew Lopez of the Gulf Coast Sports and Entertainment Network, sideline reporter for the broadcast, had a chance to sit down with him before the game yesterday, and this was their conversation. Andrew Lopez sitting here with Jordan Hawkins after a a great practice here in San Francisco. Hawk, we're going to just just kind of talk a few things here. Um You've had a great training camp, a great preseason. Obviously, it's a great couple of games to start the season. Uh, how confident are you in your game right now compared to maybe even a year ago this time? Um, I mean, I've been always been ultra confident in my game. Um, I know one thing about me, I have a work ethic. And I always work out. Uh, I think that's where it starts at, uh, just working out, working on your game. I think I've always had, uh, always had the confidence. Uh, so, I mean, it just feels good to be playing well. So. Do you feel like others others are starting to have that same level of confidence in you? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think guys are starting to trust in me more, uh, which is a great feeling to see in the work I put in the gym. Sometimes I've been working with these guys, so it's great to be rewarded. It's just good to see my teammates trusting me more. So, yeah. uh, We are talking to Z the other day, talking to um, CJ McCollum the other day, and I'm sure this is a comparison you've heard before, but they both – brought up Ray Allen when talking about your your shot. Is there any player, either current or former, or maybe it's Ray, that you model your maybe your entire game after? I want to say one specific person. I try to take a little bit from everybody's game. Uh, so I've always been a fan of like shooters like Clay, like obviously Ray, Rip, and I got a chance to meet those guys. I was just picking their brains. Um, but it's like multiple players I look at. Like Devin Booker is like one of my favorite players. I love watching him play. Um, uh, so I think if if you ask me who I want to be like, Ray, Ray, Rip, then a little bit of Devin Booker in there as well. So is it? What is it like when you hear other you know your teammates, you know, bring up Ray Allen when they when they talk about watching you shoot? I mean, it's pretty cool. Uh, I mean, uh, they was kind of doing that in college as well, but I don't. I don't really let it get to my head. I mean, I just, I've been just shooting the ball. It's something I've been doing my whole life. So, um, compared to Ray, Ray's a dog. Ray was really good at basketball. So, um, I appreciate it, but I'm not there yet. What is, uh, let, let, let's stay on the UConn yeah. right now. You, uh, you know, there's some fan support, obviously. We, we see that a lot, especially with the Duke guys. But, I mean, you, you, there's a lot of UConn. We saw probably a lot of that in Portland with you yeah. and you and Klingon up there. What is the? You see people wearing more UConn gear. Like, what? What is that love like for you when you see all this? Uh, this UConn love. Definitely, right when we here? go up to like Boston, yeah. Boston, New York. We play games up there. There's a lot of a lot of UConn in the in the crowd usually. So, I mean, it's definitely cool. But UConn fans travel everywhere. Like when we was in college, like we had fans everywhere. Like uh, the whole the whole uh, tournament run we had uh, my sophomore year, 
it was all UConn fans. Every every city it was in, it was just UConn fans, fully UConn fans. So the, the UConn, UConn family's real, real things, and their support is real. And I love all our fans. I love Connecticut. I always say Connecticut like a second home to me. So did it ever surprise you when you would be like, when you would go places and they, you have that many fans at that point? Uh, at first it did, but it was like man, it became normal. Then we started <laughs> winning and. It started becoming like a lot more. It was like to a point. I always remember. Our, I know our fans was crazy when we was playing Gonzaga in Las Vegas in the Elite Eight, mm-hmm. and we we damn near matched their crowd. So yeah, it's a lot, lot yeah. further drive. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> like so, a I, much like, longer yeah. flight, I should say. Like, yeah. Uh, looking back at your rookie year, what were some of your top moments that kind of stand out to you from from year one? Uh, obviously the Dallas game was a good game for me. Dallas, Denver had pretty good scoring games, but um, I think my best all around game was probably here uh, last year. I, played, I think I played real well. I think I did everything, everything really well, shot it well. So I think that was one of my more all around complete games, one of my favorite games from last year, San Francisco last year. Here. What was it? What was it like your first year just getting? I mean, obviously you, you played in big arenas at UConn. You played on a, a huge stage. But playing in like you know in front of a crowd like this and at Chase Center or playing, what, what were some of those moments I'd like? I'd say this Big East does help you a lot because um, I mean uh, our conference tournament we played in MSG, so nothing bigger than MSG. So we, <laughs> like we and I be we playing a lot of NBA arenas during uh, during the season at UConn, so it was nothing really big surprise for me. So I think it's playing in the Big East it, it does support help you because uh, the crowds would be crazy, like it gets crazy in there and. Playing at the MSG uh, Madison Square Garden, I played a couple times, like maybe four or five times in college. So yeah. it helps as well. Um, you've you've obviously been in Louisiana for a year now. Yeah. Do you have a better understanding of how popular Angel Reese is in Louisiana after yeah I mean, after a um, year of being here? I think last year when I we went to a football game together when she was at LSU. I was like, yeah, this is crazy. Like, she was like <laughs> I can't even be hanging around her no more. Like, it's crazy. Like, even uh, I got a chance to see her in Vegas uh, during summer league. And I was like, yeah, because, like, I'm damn near security guard now. Like, it's crazy. <laughs> so, yeah. What's that, what's that like? What was that like for you watching her first year, too? I mean, obviously, you, I mean, you're both going. You're, you're doing all this at the same time. What was yeah. it like watching her, you know, be with Chicago? I mean, it's not really surprising at all. She's always been – always had that dog in her. Um, she's always been her. She's always going to be her. So um, it's it's amazing to watch. It's amazing for the fam when you just uh, when you see somebody as a kid and then you just grow up and watch them and uh, see what they become. It's definitely cool. So yeah. CJ the other day mentioned, uh, you know, some I mean, some people on the outside may think this is kind of a quiet locker room, but it's it's not a quiet locker room. Yeah. He said you're you're not a quiet guy. No. Uh, who kind of fits that description as somebody who may seem quiet but is is definitely not a quiet guy. Um, Herb, Herb and me, honestly, people think I'm quiet, but once I get to know you, you know, I, I'm a goofball. Like I like to goof around a lot, but probably Herb. Yeah. Like if Herb, if Herb know you, he'll talk to you. Like, he's still <laughs> quiet, but like he'll talk to you. Yeah. Is anybody uh, like the opposite? Does anybody like seem like oh they're out in front and like really they're just like a reserved guy? Like on the that's a good question. Who yaps a lot? Uh, Eves can talk a little bit. Oh yeah, yeah, a little bit. He's a rookie. He's got to. He's, he's got to get used to it, right? Yeah, but he probably yeah he can talk a little bit. Eves, um, nobody thinks Trey is quiet. Yeah, yeah, he talks a lot. Um, yeah, I think Eves maybe. Who's? We'll finish with this one. Who's the best? Who talks the most trash on a team? Who who talks the most trash? And who is the best trash talker? Um, probably Brew. He's not even on the team, but probably Corey Brew. <laughs> he talks the most trash. I don't know about the best, but he definitely does talk the most. I've I've seen that yeah, on my side for a few years. Yeah, he he's talking the most trash for sure. But I don't know. He's I might be the best trash talker. Oh, well, all right. Yeah. But Brew, yeah, I gotta go. Brew, Brew yeah, definitely Brew, the most. Brew definitely talks the most trash. Yes, definitely, 100%. <laughs> appreciate it, Hawk. All right, man, appreciate it.
All right, time now to welcome in Mr. John DeShazer, analyst for the Pelicans Radio Network and also part, of course, of NewOrleansSaints.com. J.D., thanks for joining us, and I feel sorry for you. I mean, the West Coast has not been kind to New Orleans in the past couple of days. Hey, you got to play the games. You do what you do, and the schedule is what it is, and your record is what you are. So, um, <laughs> hey, until both teams play better, that's the way it's going to be. That's how it goes. Uh, we got a lot to get into here. I guess just overall thoughts. It's crazy. I was thinking about it walking in the parking lot this morning. I was talking a little bit about it with Jim yesterday during the game. If and, and, and in a post game, I, I said it to Todd, if I'd have told you you'd have shot fifty four percent, shot more free throws, out rebounded the Warriors. Brandon Ingram had thirty, Zion had thirty one, and you lost in a game that almost didn't feel competitive in the second half. John, what'd you say? I, I was drinking. Uh, I wouldn't. Well, I would ask you how many times you turn it over. Um, you yep. got to factor that in, and mm-hmm. then you know, then I would say okay, because you know, and then I would say, what did the peripheral guys do besides Z and Bi? Because when those two guys get the lion's share that way, then somebody's going to probably fall off. Somebody's numbers aren't going to be right. So from that standpoint, yeah, I would have taken it. I would have said, you know what, I'd like to see thirty and thirty out of those guys every game. But who did who who was the supporting cast? Who gave them some 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 support? And did they did they hold on to the basketball? And you look at the box score, man, it it's there are some numbers there that are whopping. That really, and I mean, it's, it's four games into the season, so you know, I ain't gonna I ain't gonna call for the code red yet. But I mean, there's some numbers there that are disturbing from that standpoint, being this early in the season, so. Yeah, if, if you'd have told me those two guys got 30 apiece, I'd say, well, the Pels would probably be in pretty good shape. But then I think, you know, okay, well, who 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 else chipped in and did they hold on to the basketball? Because you figure if they scored 30, they probably held on to the ball. Mm-hmm. But um, not so. Not so the case. Right, I'm going to ask you about those numbers here in a quick second. Overall thoughts, Jim? No, I mean, J.D. nailed the first thing on my list of things that need to be rectified. I mean, the turnovers is a huge problem. Uh, I'm not sure if I remember a game where that one factor – was such a big difference in the outcome of the game. I mean, I think it was 24 turnovers for the Pelicans and six or seven for the Warriors. I mean, you can't give up 17, 18 possessions to another team. And, I mean, I thought in the first half, too, the way the game started where Golden State was looking like a team that was going to have a hard time getting to 60, 70 points, they scored, you know, 14 points in the first quarter. I was thinking the one thing the Pelicans need to do (laughs) is make sure they don't turn the ball over because if they turn the ball over, all of a sudden you're giving Golden State so much easier offense. It it looked like the Warriors were going to have a hard time in the half court generating offense with the guys that they have on the court. But, I mean, the Pelicans did everything they could possibly do to help them get going and I think once Golden State got the momentum started scoring some points all of a sudden it went from okay we're having a hard time doing anything to this is going to be easy and that's what it turned into for the last three quarters you know it's regular season I I gotta add this in but you know what Golden State looked like they looked like Oklahoma City they were sharks they jumped Mm. the pills and I mean that aggression was like overwhelming for New Orleans which you would like that to not be the case but it was. It was It was like they said, okay, we saw another team do this to them, so let's see if it'll work for us. And it did. And big time. John, you bring up a point, too, because I'm going to play what Brandon Ingram had to say. It's literally what you just said. I felt like last night I kept turning behind me in the studio at the SKC and CJ McCollum was on the ground or a Pelican player was being bumped and, and the ball was being turned over because they were picked by. It, it was just the physical nature to it. Here's what B.I. had to say. I picked up the physicality a little bit. Um, got us out of some of our sets, sped us up a little bit, and um, they started going on a run on the offensive end. Buddy here hit a couple shots, well, some some loud some loud threes, and um, they started going into their split game a little bit, which they've been good no matter who's on the floor for a lot of years. So um, the defensive intensity picked up a little. bit. So is that the calling card as to how to yeah. attack? I mean, look, this, this team right now? and most teams, you're not going to play like this from different teams 82 nights a, a year. That's just not going to happen. And the Pels probably will have more efficiency uh, from other players also. But this is a, a tried and true recipe as we see it now against the Pelicans. Be as aggressive as you possibly can and get them to turn it over. Jump the guards in the backcourt, especially when you're not dealing with DeJounte Murray. You don't have your point out there. And, and point Zion and point and point B.I. You know, Zion turned it over seven times last night. Seven 
times. And the Pels turned it over 24, and Jim was nice to him. He said 5-6. Um, Golden State only turned it over. Golden State turned it over eight times, 24 to eight, three to one, in the turnover ratio where you commit 24 and they commit eight, and they score 34 points off turnovers. That's a lot of points. You can't win in the NBA that way. You can't beat any team on any night when you're giving up that much and they score that many points off turnovers. I don't care what you do. I don't care what you shoot. It's hard. You cannot win that game. So when you, when you turn it over that way, and again, Golden State got on the feeding frenzy. They were like, oh, we got one. Oh, we got two. Hey, 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 let's jump everybody and see if they'll turn it over. And sure enough, everybody had a hand in the pile of turnovers. And when it gets up to 24, man, 24, 24 turnovers against 23 assists. That's not yeah. a good ratio. That is not a good <laughs> ratio. And, you know, we, now we saw the Pels on that feeding frenzy in the, in the season opener. We saw it against mm-hmm. Chicago. And we were like, man, this is fun to watch. You know, they forced 20 turnovers and they blocked 10, 15 shots or whatever mm-hmm. it was. And it was like, woohoo. And then when it flips over on you, it's like, you know, this is kind of miserable. And this is the this is the way. If I'm an opponent, I look at the film. Everybody does, and I say, "Do we have the players that we can be this aggressive against that team?" And even if I don't have the players that can be that aggressive, I at least got to try and see mm-hmm. if it'll work. Because this team, unfortunately, has shown a propensity to flip it over when they get that kind of pressure. And I, I understand it goes back to the playoff series, and that's a whole different season. But it's there. You know, film don't lie. And it's there that when you pressure this team, unfortunately, it gets a little bit shaky in terms of caring for the basketball. And, I mean, B.I. hit it on the head. He's like, you know, they got us out of a set. They, they got aggressive. Well, how do you counter aggression? You, 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 you beat it with aggression. You've got to. Because if they just see you being, you know, kind of passive and, you know, if, if you dribble up the court, man, and they're putting pressure on you and you turn your back, they got you where you want. Yep. They got you where they want you. That's, it, that's what they want you to do. You turn your back, and it's like, okay, we have got them out of their rhythm. We've got them out of their set. Now let's jump passing lanes, or let's swarm the dude who's got his back turned, and let's turn this thing over. And if you if you play that way, it's going to be hard to win a game. At one point I noticed, I looked this up during the game, The of the first 37 points Golden State had, 16 of them were off turnovers by New Orleans. I mean, that's a ratio that you wow. don't see very often yeah. where almost half of their points – came off of turnovers and then I mean it didn't get much better as the game went on in terms of the ratio uh, the the chunk of the points that they scored from that but you know I think one of the things that's frustrating to me you guys mentioned the term sharks that the other team are kind of circling the water saying like Mm -hmm. okay we can go after these guys I think what was frustrating to me from the game against Golden State was that it was very similar to what happened in the Portland game where the other team had the upper hand in the aggression in the hustle plays I mean that's one of the things that you can't have happen, you know, repeatedly is that the other team is a step quicker to loose balls, that they look more physical than you. So, I mean, I think that's the biggest thing I want to see tonight in the game Wednesday is just to counter, like JD said, I mean, you got to take swings at the other team when they swing at you. You can't just cower and be like, you know, we're going to just take this and, and, and try to see what we can do. Um, I think another part of it too, I noted, I mean, we talk a lot in 2024 in the NBA about points per possession because that's a lot fancier than just talking about total points. But, yeah. I mean, you got to look at the Pelicans in the last three games scored 105, 103, and 106. Those are their point totals. I mean, the Washington Wizards right now are 15th in the NBA in scoring average, which I picked them because it's the exact middle of the NBA, and they've, they're averaging 113 a game. So mm. I feel like if you look at just the raw point totals – you, you're not going to be able to win if you're. If this is the kind of offense that you're producing, especially against good teams. And I think to add to one of the things that you said, J.D., about um, the defensive pressure that the other teams are applying to, I feel like one of the issues is that they're getting into the offense really late. Yes. It's not just <laughs> yes. that – it's not just fast break points. It's not just transition. Sometimes it's that – you haven't even gotten into your the play that you're running or the execution, and there's already 12 seconds on the shot clock. There's a huge difference between that and getting into stuff at 18 or 20 in terms of the different options that you can run. I mean, I think there were definitely some possessions last night where it was like they were so late getting into stuff that they, if one thing was cut off, they ended up in a in a pickle where it's like, okay, what do yeah. we do now? Yeah, and, and I got it. DeJounte Murray is missed. That is a fact. They practice with him – through training camp, he had a very nice first game. 
he is missed. That I do not discount that. I, I don't underplay that. But this team has played together enough without him over the last three, four, five years yeah. to where these guys should be able to just quickly on the fly because this is the core of what they've had mm-hmm. the last several years. So, yeah, I know that's a big acquisition and you've gotten accustomed to having them out there. But to not have them out there shouldn't be this debilitating. It should not for this team that has played together a decent amount of games. To your point, here's Zion Williamson following the game on not having DeJounte and if it's a factor right now. You know, you practice a certain way all training camp, and then, you know, we lose in our guard with DeJounte. So, you know, we're NBA players. we got to make that adjustment quick. But uh, I don't think it's a cause for panic. I think it's just... We need to lock in. It's it's 82 games. You know, to your point, John, it's true. And, Jim, you can comment on this as well. I mean, Daniel Tice and and Eve Misi, right? But everybody else on that floor, to your point, was the starting unit last year for most of the games on a team that should have won 50 games. I want to ask you something that's different, though, that I've noticed. Herb Jones, I know he got injured yesterday, but even before going into that, point-wise and point total hadn't really been a factor early in the season. Last year, I felt like he was hitting a lot of corner threes. Also, you saw, again, another team for a second, third straight game. They weren't going to let Jordan Hawkins get a shot off. Yeah. And that's, again, that's something that teams have done there in the past. So until Trey Murphy comes back, I, I don't know. Is it just a Trey thing? Is it just a DeJounte thing? Or is it just, as I said, th- there's a way to beat this team right now until this team shows how to counter that. Teams are just going to take their swing at it? Well, how do, how do you explain that? Well, what are these guys doing to help one another? Is it a lot of iso ball or is it, you know, are you screening for Jordan Hawkins off the ball and getting him free? I mean, you got to help the guy out. You know, I was watching him, you know, Tuesday night and I noticed that, you know, Golden State was doing a lot of things to get Buddy Heal shots. You got to get guys. Steph Curry in his career has not been, you know, a get you off the – now, yeah, he can get his off the dribble. But they set screens for those guys. You, you he work, runs the entire game. Yeah, you work to get your guys open. So what are the Pelicans doing to, to work to get Jordan Hawkins open? Because Jordan Hawkins is not going to be allowed to be a catch-and-shoot you know, catch sniper. Folks are going fi- you know, to say, okay, what else do you have in your bag? Can you get to your mid-range game? And you know, it looks like he's worked on that. and looks like he might be, might be you know, getting better at that. But – He's an outside shooter that, you know, if you set enough screens and you get him on the move enough, he's going to get some open looks. You know, that's just the law of averages. It's, it's going to be there, especially when you got Zion and B.I. on the floor with him. He should be able to get some looks. Herb, you know, we've seen Herb have some dips. And I always say a guy plays to the back of his card. So he's a 40% three-point shooter. He's going to get there in my mind because he's got enough on his resume that says he's going to get there. He's going to have one of those stretches where he's going to make – you know, 12 out of 19 threes or something like that. And he's going to get back to to where he is. So I'm not necessarily worried about it. And we know Herb's going to work. You know, he's not a guy who's going to sulk. He's a guy who's going to work. And he's going to play to the back of his car. So I'm not necessarily so much concerned about that. But Jordan Hawkins kind of finding his ways in his second year. And he's going to have to have a little bit of help from his teammates. The, 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 the motion and the screens, they're going to have to help him out a little bit. Because, you know, we saw last night. There was a lot of iso ball, and that's yeah. just not conducive to fluidity and scoring. Jim Jim noted, you know, the scoring troubles for this team the last three games, you know, 106 points a game probably, something like that. Well, a lot of that happens from iso ball where, yeah. you know, the ball isn't moving. It's sticking in guys' hands, and they're saying, okay, go get me something. Well, you know what? B.I. and Zion got 30 apiece, and they scored 106 and lost by 18. So what does that tell you? If I'm the opponent, I'm saying, okay, he can get his 28, he can 100%. get his 30. Yeah. Can we stop the rest of these guys? Because we we might not be able to stop them, but we can get the rest of these guys. And you can win that way <laughs> if you play in the Pelicans. So they got to share the basketball, and they got to help their teammates get open. They got to make sure that the movement is there off the ball and the screens are there off the ball to hopefully get this offense a little bit more fluid. I think we've seen – you know, you make a bunch of good points there, JD. We've seen in the last couple games in particular that the opponent is setting each other up for easy baskets at a pretty decent rate. I mean, Portland got a bunch of stuff easy because of either good passing, good movement, maybe they forced some turnovers and scored that way, um, or, or or whatever. But it just seems like they're 
you, you know, you can talk about specific players of, okay, what can we do for this guy to get him better shots, get him more shots. But I also think, too, that the tone of the game overall, like if you compare the way the game against Chicago looked, especially in the last mm. two quarters, two or three quarters, compared to what it was against Golden State, I mean, for guys like Herb, for guys like Javante Green, um, you could go down the list. Some of these guys are secondary options on offense where – if you can get them some runouts, you can get some fast break dunks the way Javante runs the floor. I think the right. offense is going to come so much more easily for those type of players. And that's really what part of what the Pelicans need to do too. We have I don't think we talked that much yet about defense, but I mean, they got to stop the ball at a better rate and they got to force more turnovers. Um JD said it was eight turnovers, which it, it didn't even seem like that many, nah, but it didn't. I mean, it didn't. <laughs> you, if you, I just think I look at the way, if you just think in your head of what you remember the Chicago game being like, and then you compare it to Golden State, they need to play so much more like they did against the Bulls than what they did against the Warriors for some of the other, you know, the third option, the fourth option, the fifth option in the offense for those guys to get going. I mean, if, if everything is going to be difficult for those level of scores, you're not going to get consistent production from those guys throughout the season. I think the thing that's interesting to me is you heard Zion say it there. A um, couple of players have been saying it. Coach Green said, too, look, it's 82 games. They said it after the Portland game. It's 82 games. I understand that fully, guys. I also just looked to my right while you guys were talking. I was paying attention, but it was for this point that I'm about to make. Uh, within the next week here, when they start this homestand, you're about to face, Jim, to your point about scoring, some pretty good guards. Tyrese Halliburton, guys of that nature, Trey Young, those teams that can score. Right after that, the size comes into a factor. And we've seen, J.D., size be a factor against this team already in four games. Orlando's coming. Denver's coming. The Lakers are coming. These are teams that are coming here within the next two weeks. So, Jim, if we're having trouble scoring... And John, size is on its way, and size has already been a factor, clinging, things of that nature, Kamunga, uh, Kaminga. I, I'm not panicking, but I'm a little concerned. Well, size is going to be a factor all season because you got what you got if you're the Pelicans. On the roster, you have what you have, and this is the choice that was made. So the way I think you, you best counter that is this team cannot be as – I don't want to – What's? I'm looking for a good word. This team's got to be more energetic. Energetic. I don't want to say a bad word the other way. This team's got to be more energetic. you got to play with a pace and with a fervor, and you got to play because you don't want other teams to look like they want it more than you. Mm. And, and, and yep. Portland, that second game and this first game against Golden State, they looked like they were hungry, and the Pels looked like they were not – necessarily hungry they looked hungry for a quarter against golden state and then it was like they felt like okay i'm full and i'm good and golden state was like hey we just in the we're in the third round man we got we got nine more rounds to go here let's get it and so you can't be less than energetic when you don't have size because this is a chip in everybody's got to chip in when you don't have size besides you know what tyson and eve Misi. You just you you're at a disadvantage from that standpoint. So everybody, you gotta you gotta collectively rebound, and you gotta have a lot of energy. You gotta you gotta play with some some pace, and you gotta play with some want, and you gotta play with some hunger, because if the other team is the one that has that, then you can see the results like we've seen the last couple of games, and really the first you know kind of the first game against Portland that they did come back and win. It was like, are they gonna be able to pull this out? Is is this gonna you know this doesn't look good right now? So you got to have that kind of that kind of come out every game. This team, I don't think this team can afford to to Cadillac in and you know get a feel mm -hmm. for it and you know hey we're gonna shadow box here for a second. You got to come out throwing haymaker. You got to come out punching. And I think and again I understand it's eighty two games. That's a long season, man. But you got you can't have emotional dips, especially this early in the season. You gotta you gotta get after it. I want to see them put on some video footage in the locker room of some, par of some piranhas because that's what I want to see on the <laughs> yes. rebounding game. Yeah. I want to see – maybe we'll have, you know, in post game for radio, Swarming? we'll, we'll okay. have a piranha factor on right. rebounding. You'll be able to say, okay, Jim, what was the piranha factor on the on the rebounding? <laughs> because that's what they need. They need everyone to be – and I used that exact word two days ago on the podcast that J.D. used as far as hunger 
goes that you got to be hungrier than some of these other teams. But um, in terms of some of the comments about, you know, it's an 82 game season, we understand that there's a ton of time left in the year. But I'm also not going to sit here after I said all offseason and in preseason that every single game is important in the West this year and then just be like, yeah, you know, they can get yeah. off to a decent That's start a or whatever. Yeah. I mean, you have to have urgency right now. I don't want to wait until December. And then the other part of it, too, is, I mean, we know and, and they mentioned this on the TNT broadcast a few times last night as far as, you know, we understand this team doesn't have Trey Murphy and DeJounte Murray. But at the same time, I think. There's enough talent. There's plenty of talent on this. the rest of this roster. There's plenty of teams in the league that would kill to have the core group that this team has with you know Zion, B.I., uh, Herb Jones, C.J. McCollum, some of the other role players. So I, you can't sit here and, and say, like, okay, well, if they lose to some of these teams that are – you know, at the bottom of the standings or teams that don't have some of their main guys, like obviously the Warriors, that that's okay. I mean, I think th- there's there's no reason to think that they can't still be c- competitive. And I know you mentioned some of the teams that they opponents that they have coming up. I still think that you know they should be able to win games. The game Wednesday is huge. This four game home stand is huge. Um, but it's definitely not time to start already be like, okay, well we don't have these guys, so we can't compete at a high level. Yeah, and, and you know. What? One of the counters, what's one of the counters when you don't have great size? Threes. This team is averaging 33-point attempts a game through the first four. Small sample size, but 30. They want to average 40. That's a pretty big gap. When you're talking about we want to average 40 and we're averaging 30. Last night against Golden State, 9 of 22. Golden State, 21 of 46. That's a huge disparity. Mm -hmm. That is... That and the turnovers is the game. That's it. That's the game. Yeah, that's it. Mm-hmm. You know, when you want to, if you, if, and that's what I, that was one of the things we, we led into the season with are the Pelicans going to revert to what they've been or are they going to be what they say they want to be? Mm-hmm. Well, you say you want to average 40 attempts, you got to get to 40. You can't be at 30. <laughs> and if yeah. you, or I 22. Mean, yeah, you yeah. can't be at 22. Mm-hmm. I mean, so they're reverting to what they have been as opposed to what they say they want to be. And meanwhile, you get a game where they double you up. You know, you make nine, they make 21. You attempt 22, they attempt 46. Well, you you can't win that game. You, you can't win that game. Golden State scored 36 more points on three-pointers, and they had 16 more possessions from turnovers. Yeah. So if you didn't know anything about basketball and you didn't watch the game yeah. at all, and I gave you those two stats, I think it's you'd be like, bad. I think I think it's Golden literally. State's got this one. Yeah. Yeah. You look at that one, you'd be like, you know what, I'm surprised he lost by just 18. I thought it yeah. might be more than that. That's I mean, that, that's yeah. a huge number. Mm-hmm. All right, well, let me ask you all this as we wrap up here. How do you fix that? Because it, obviously on social media, it's the coach. It's the game plan. It's You're watching the game, and, and Todd's like, hey, guys have to take them. I mean, I have highlights of yeah. him saying, can't make them if you don't take them. So, so J.D., look, it's obvious. There's no doubt they're talking about it. There's no doubt the coach is talking to them about it. How do you fix it? you got to force yourself to do it. I, I'll give you a quick story. Now, I am – when I stand for a long time, I, I generally – tend to lean on my left leg i'll just i don't know why i you know i had right knee surgery a long time ago but i just tend to lean on my left leg and i will consciously tell myself hey stop doing that and i'll try to stand up on both legs and i'll try to tilt some on the right leg but i always end up back on the left leg (laughs) that's just my nature okay and this team's nature is to not shoot threes they're they're going to have to consciously say we have to take that shot and that doesn't just mean Jordan Hawkins. And that doesn't just mean C.J. McCollum. Mm-hmm. That doesn't, and Brandon Ingram's going to have to chip in a little bit more. But look, Z's got to take more than one or two every now and then. I mean, these guys, when you get open looks, Jose Alvarado or whoever it is, you've got to take those looks. That's what the, that's what the whole premise of this is. If you're going to be under, you can't be undersized and try to play inside. That ain't gonna that that mm-hmm. those two things don't go together. Can it be as simple as having a coach or a hey, somebody? I'm gonna write on a sheet of paper. Ten let me, threes a dude, quarter. Dude, let me tell you something. I'm just saying. Let can me it tell be you as something. Simple as if, that. If, hey, at if six, the coaching staff tells you we want to shoot forty and they're screaming at guys to take shots, that, what else you want? <laughs> what else? I, yeah. What else you know, you know, players <laughs> dream of their coach saying, what else shoot you, as much as you possibly yeah, can. Like, what else do you want? Yeah. I'm just trying to think of the most simplistic factor. Yeah, like, yeah. do I need to get a, Look, a notepad here? It's as simple, like, it's as, simple as that. Marks. Guys have their nature, and I understand that. They have their comfort zones, and you you re, you resort to your comfort zone 
when there's pressure or when there, you know, things aren't going well. So you do what you normally did did that makes you feel comfortable. And you got to be uncomfortable. In a game like that, why not shoot 40? You, you're trailing and, and they're coming back up. Why not put up the shot? They're open shots. And sometimes they are the best shot you will get on that possession. That's the best look you're going to get instead of Z going in against three guys or B.I. backing somebody down and, you know, eating eight seconds up before he can get up, get off his fadeaway. The open look sometimes early is the best look you're going to get in that set. And they're telling these guys, shoot it, shoot it, shoot it. It's like it's like you know Prince on the Chappelle show. Shoot the J, shoot it, <laughs> shoot it. I mean, I, I don't look. If you're an NBA player, like I just said, what else do you want? Yeah. What else do you want besides a mm-hmm. coach who says we want you to shoot the ball? Right. We're gonna practice shooting mm-hmm. threes. We're gonna work this into what we do. And when you get that open look, like you've been doing in shoot around, like you've been doing in practice, we want you to take that shot. And guys won't take the shot. So then it's like. Okay, I don't I don't know how much of that you can blame on the coaching staff. I just yeah. I don't know how much of that you can you can you can attribute to, you know, poor designs when a guy just won't take an open shot. Cuz look here, I'm 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 58 and I can't play a drop now, but if I'm out there and I get a wide open look, <laughs> I'm shooting. It. Yeah. I'm I mean, shooting it. <laughs> you know, you ain't got to tell you ain't got to tell me twice. I'm gonna shoot it. So, you know, these guys this is their craft. This is what they work on and this is what they're telling them. We want you to do the things that you do in practice. We want you to do the things that you do in shoot around. We want you to take these shots that we ask you to practice. Jim, I just pulled up the uh, the contact card list because I now have the Pelicans email. Willie Green, what am I what am I emailing him this morning? I think how do we fix this? I, th- I think there's definitely some. There might be some X's and O's, and I've, that we you can change, and we've gone through that. But to me, a lot of the a lot of what you need is going to come from more energy, more effort. Mm-hmm. I think some of the getting more open threes will come from playing better defense, creating more turnovers, playing running the floor better. I mean, to me, that's a lot of it. I think a lot of the problems that would we're we're talking about would be solved by if you. You have to at least match the effort of the other team. You can't be a step behind yeah. all the time. Because I, I feel like it's not just the last two games that they lost that we said that. But I think for the first Portland game, I think that was the case as well. But fortunately, they were able to still pull off that win. But, I mean, to me, that's what it comes down to. Um, one last thing, too. I mean, J.D. referenced that, you know, you can't be undersized and fill in the blank. I think you also can't be undersized – and rec- acknowledge that we're probably going to have nights where we get beat on the boards, mm-hmm. but you can't add add to that being an under um, being a underwhelming offensive team, being a below average oh. offensive team. I mean, you can't if you're going to be undersized if you're going to play with smaller lineups. You you have to. I mean, it's almost a given that you think, well, we're doing that because we know we're going to be great on offense or at least very good. So, I mean, that combination you, is going to be tough to overcome. They they have to be so much better on offense, but I think that some of that will come from other parts of the game that contribute to that the way we saw in the Chicago game. All right, to wrap up, middle of the, the pack, 15 out of 30. The Wizards, they're averaging what? 113 Kings points. won last night, 113.96. Mavs beat the T-Wolves, 120.114, so it's above that. Mm-hmm. Nuggets and Nets in a defensive battle, 144 to 139. So mm-hmm. tonight... Try to get to one thirteen or a higher. Is that what? That's yeah. That sounds good to me. Yeah, I want to see one thirteen or higher. I want to see this team get up to thirty five attempted threes at right, least. You want to see thirty five threes. You yeah. want to see close to one thirteen. Yeah, and sure. I'm and I'm yeah. look. I, I hope they get to the forty because the more you take, the more likely you have a chance to make them. Mm-hmm. The more you take, you can't make them. <laughs> you, you don't shoot them. <laughs> I hear you, sir. It's some, yeah, the good thing about it, we're not back on the West Coast for a while. Right? <laughs> we're Saints on the East Coast over at Charlotte, and New Orleans will be here in New Orleans. You know, it's funny. I thought about this last night, too. What we've seen on this road trip so far is what you you should be accustomed to in the NBA, where you play great at home against the Bulls, and then you have struggles on the road. This is, this is normal for the NBA. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, last year yeah. was such an aberration as far as, like, why can't they win at home? But they're they go out on the road and they're up thirty five on Philly in the second <laughs> right. half, and they're up thirty seven yeah. against Atlanta in the next game. I mean, this, to me, this is much more of what you would expect. Obviously, not to this level to where they're struggling to this degree over all three games. But man, I, we'll we'll feel a lot better if they win Wednesday night. But either mm-hmm. way. I am very happy to see them be able to come home and have four games in a row yeah. at home and see what they can do with that. Well, yeah, you can get right real quick at home. Well, there'll be an important one. Friday, Indiana, Atlanta on Sunday. 
Portland on Monday, a back-to-back it in Cleveland on Wednesday. John, as always, appreciate the time, sir. Thank you. Yep, go check them out at NewOrleansSaints.com. And, of course, a analyst on the Pelicans Radio Network. And, Jim, stick around. we still got to wrap up today's podcast. Our thanks to John DeShazer, Andrew Lopez, and Jordan Hawkins. Jim Eichenhofer, um, it is Wednesday, so it's Western Conference Wednesday. What is the team that we're keeping an eye on? The team to watch over the next seven days for me is going to be the San Antonio Spurs. They start out one and two, but I think main reason I picked them is their schedule coming up is really interesting. Wednesday tonight at Oklahoma City, Thursday at Utah, then they host the Timberwolves, and then they're at the Clippers to start another road trip. I mean, so far I think the Spurs have been um, kind of up and down, and I think one of the things that we're keeping an eye on with them is for a lot of the offseason, I think there was a big question. Are they going to be a team that competes for the plan? Are they going to be closer to the 22 win team that they were last year? Are they going to be somewhere in the middle? I mean, if they're somewhere in the middle, they're not going to be in the play in race. So I'm curious to see, you know, how competitive they're going to be. I think overall, I don't think the first week has been a great sign for them. They're one and two right now. They split a couple games with Houston. Mm-hmm. They lost a game against Dallas. I don't think Wembenyama has been, you know, great so far. I think he's his offensive efficiency has been down. Um, people are starting to be able to kind of push him out further from the basket, make him take jumpers. So the Spurs are the team to watch for this week. And by the way, the team to watch – Last week was the Phoenix Suns based on their schedule. Oh boy. They were three and one. Yeah. I mean, they split a couple games with the Lakers. They beat the Clippers and they beat Dallas. So I mean, I think if you want to grade the team to watch for week one, I would give them maybe an A minus. That's a that's a really good week if you look at the, their three and one start. I felt like over the weekend and leading into this uh week of games, Jim, all I saw was a lot of people saying that they are now and they're moving up and not that you and I gamble or bet because we can't. But the right. odds of them going and winning the West or going to mm-hmm. the NBA Finals, even winning the NBA Finals, I feel like has jumped up. Now, I understand it's four games. The right. point being that you're making is their performance in those three wins has a lot of people going, hmm, my Budenhoser, look at what this team is doing, look mm-hmm. at this offense, yep. and that starts. So, and look, we we in New Orleans don't need to know what Devin Booker can do against this team right. and Durant right. and stuff. Mm-hmm. It was just them meshing. So, it is interesting. You pick them. They're three and one. Let's see what happens with this person. Yeah, I mean, Boonholzer has very specific things that he's bringing to them that can make them better or try to improve them. I think they're one of the things that they're going to do is take more three pointers. But also, Tyus Jones coming in, I think, has made a, a big impact. And the last aspect of Western Conference Wednesday for this week is I'm going to have stock up, stock down yes. on some teams. Um, this week's stock up, I'm going with the Clippers because they actually coincidentally were the stock down team last week as we headed into the regular season. But, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm impressed by the fact that they their opening game, they probably could have easily beaten Phoenix. They lost to them in overtime. Then they had two really impressive road wins on the weekend where they won at Denver and then they won at Golden State. So, I mean... I talked about how the Spurs are kind of an X factor in the play-in race. I mean, you could say the same thing for the Clippers. Is it possible that they're going to be one of those teams that's better than we think they're they're going to be? Um, James Harden is off to a really good start. Their role players, I think, have contributed a ton. They have some winnable games coming up as well. So, I mean, they could be a team that maybe gets off to a good start and becomes a factor. And then the stock down for me is the Denver Nuggets. I mean, they're 2-2 two and two right now. But they started off getting blown out by Oklahoma City. Then they lost to the Clippers in Denver. They have two wins in a row, but, I mean, they won by the skin of their teeth against Toronto. And then they did the same thing against Brooklyn, two teams that are kind yeah, of— 139 points by yeah. Brooklyn? So either I mean, Brooklyn's really good or is Denver not playing I defense? Mean, that game did go to overtime, but still, you're right. That's a lot of points. In the game before that against Toronto, they won— 127 to 125 so not only i think has denver's defense looked a little shaky but they're struggling to get consistent production from everyone besides the joker and i mean I've, that's a big problem that they've they've had roster attrition the last couple off seasons where they've lost some key guys and they are hoping and expecting some of their younger players to step up and fill those spots but it hasn't really happened to much of a high degree so i mean Denver is definitely a team that has a little bit of concerns right now. And I think, too, from a bigger picture standpoint, 
a lot of people predicted that, you know, there's a top four in the West and that the Nuggets are in that group. But what if they're not? I think that changes a lot of the dynamics of how we'll look at the elite level of the Western Conference race. Well, that's interesting. As we uh, wrap up this Wednesday edition of the Pelicans pod, we, we're going to do this, too. It's my little contribution to it. I just want to you know, take a look at the East and West real quick, 10, 15 seconds. But mm-hmm. the Bucks are one in three. The Pacers yeah, are one in sure. three. That's mm-hmm. very interesting. Yep. The Cavaliers and Celtics, the only two undefeated teams in the East. They're four no. By the way, Cleveland's coming next Wednesday to New Orleans. And then over in the Western Conference, only one unbeaten. That's not a surprise. We knew they'd beat up each other. OKC is three and zero as we record this. Phoenix three and one. Lakers three and one. Dallas three and one. Golden State three and one. Clippers two and one, and then a bunch of teams, including the Pels, are two and two. There's six teams yes. that are two and two right now. The only yep. team that have not won a game this season. The Pistons, the only other team in the East. So those two teams. So just kind of give you an idea as to where the league is, and we'll see where they are next week. But some surprises, like I didn't think Milwaukee was one and three. But that's to mm-hmm. your point. You know, imagine how they feel over there, right, with Giannis and their guys and the Pacers. That was an exciting team last year. So I know New Orleans is two and two. But to your point, as we wrap up with JD, and as you heard. Earlier with head coach Willie Green, Zion, and B.I., you got to get this win tonight, man. Yeah, I mean, this is this is for the fifth game of the season. I feel like um, this is up there in terms of the importance because not only just record-wise, but, I mean, I think the feeling around the team will be so much different. I mean, you could say, okay, what's, is it that big of a difference between 3-2 three and 2-3? Two and two and three? I think it is because going into this homestand, I mean, to be able to go two and two on the road trip, it still wasn't a great road trip, but at least you can say we bounced back. We beat the we Golden State in the second game um, without Steph Curry. And then hopefully you can get a, on a little bit of a roll in this homestand coming up. Well, for me, it's simple. You, you want to play good basketball because if you don't lose, if you don't win today and you lose, that's four straight games because the win, the lone win on the road trip so far. That was a struggle. Right. I mean, you, you mm-hmm. had to have a B.I. game-winning shot, essentially four seconds to play, and a block at the rim that if it goes in, it goes into overtime. Right. And heaven it's forbid it game. goes in, mm-hmm. and it's an and one. They could have shot a free throw with no time on the clock and beaten you. So I think that's the main reason why you're bringing that up. No, you're not he, panicking, but what you're saying is, hey, you don't win today. That's four straight games that you didn't play winning basketball. No, you're that's totally, a lot. You're totally right beyond – what you can measure objectively with the numbers and the standings and the records, it's it's really more, it's not as much that they've lost two games in a row, it's the way that they've lost those games that makes you say they need to have some major urgency to, like you said, just play better basketball, and then we'll let the results take care of themselves. If you play a lot better, I think we'll be much happier and we'll be okay with the outcome yeah. either it's way. It's a nice long flight. They can take a nap tomorrow, you know, on the way yeah, over here. It's sure. an off day. They don't play mm-hmm. till Friday night, but that's the point, right? You you have to leave it on the floor tonight and, and play, as J.D. just said, as the more desperate team. I know mm-hmm. it's early, but it's okay to play like, hey, we're not leaving here without a win. That's all we're saying. 100%. Jim Eikenoff for Pelicans.com. As always, man, appreciate it. Are you uh, – Am I bringing a knapsack tonight to you, or uh, yeah, I will mail be, it in again. I will be in the. Uh, I will be in your presence. Yes. I, will, I look forward to yes. being in the blender, yeah. and uh, hopefully it'll be a fun. It's going to be a late night, but hopefully it'll be a fun late night. It's nothing we'll, like that twelve forty five stroll across the parking <laughs> lot, lot four, going into the parking lot. It's really nice. And hopefully we'll yeah. take some, especially on the eve of Halloween. <laughs> what is that? Huh? What? Yeah. What? <laughs> don't don't worry. I, I I will be I will be there for your security. <laughs> to, I'm sure you'll feel a lot better with me there. Well, I will. Just, I'm, look, I love you to death, but if I if I hear ding, 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 I hear some sort of chainsaw, you know, yeah. coming from the you know the far end of the parking uh-huh. lot. Uh huh. First one to the car, man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> yep. You know, I mean, it's, I, it's like the saying of I you got don't a child, man. you don't have to be the fastest. <laughs> no, you just have to not be the slowest. <laughs> That's so exactly right. When there's a bear chasing <laughs> after you, so yeah, Although there you when go. You look at these horror movies. It, what's always amazing to me is uh, the killer or the villain, however you want to look at it, they walking. They walk. <laughs> they, they, That's true. People trying to get away That's are true. running. Mm-hmm. There's a tree. There's their fall. Something happens. Mm-hmm. You know, something goes in their eye. But they go back and they show axe wielder, knife, mm-hmm. chainsaw. 
They're walking. You're right. The, <laughs> the villain the villain never shows a lot of urgency. No, the villain al- right. always is like, I got this. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm going to catch up to you eventually. Yep. <laughs> like, you're right. yep. you're going to run out of gas. You'll, yep. you'll find the lone door in the building that is locked. You know? yep. <laughs> yep. you'll, abs- you'll severely twist your ankle mm-hmm. you know? <laughs> Definitely. on a flat piece of pavement. Something will happen that will benefit the, yep. the villain in the, the movie. It's the villain really always, incredible. The villain always knows the script, but the... Yeah. The, the really people incredible. trying to get away don't know the script, yeah, so it's, it's, uh, it's again, amazing. Very incredible. And this yep. just in, Jim already passed this along to me, too, as well. Tomorrow being Halloween, uh, if there is, you know, a house with shrieks coming in or just for no reason lightning or things, like that, just don't go there. I mean, I just, I you know. That's my tip for Halloween. <laughs> that's it. Just, don't go there. Word of, it, word dark, of advice. Darkened street with a guy in a hockey mask. Go the yep. other way. It's yep. just it's simple things like that. And more importantly, don't fall asleep. For Jim Eichenhoff, from Gus Cattengill. It's the Pelicans podcast. And this Wednesday, we'll see you on Friday on wherever you get your Pelicans podcast. Thanks for listening to the New Orleans Pelicans podcast. Join us three times per week on Pelicans.com, the Pelicans mobile app, the iHeartRadio app, or where you get your podcast. And be sure to give Jim and Gus a follow on X at Jim underscore Eichenhofer and GCAT underscore 17. We'll see you next time right here on the New Orleans Pelicans podcast.